Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, New York-based author Martin Amis, uh, who's somehow under the impression that we care what he thinks about British politics, uh, had a go at Comrade Corbyn this week. According to the author, humorless, as he calls him, Jezza, he is not intellectually up to being leader of the Labour Party. Apparently his two E's at A-level and one year at a trade union studies course at North London Poly are not the ideal qualifications for a prospective prime minister. We wholeheartedly disagree. It's far better than doing two or three years on a trade union study course at North London Poly. That really would be a problem. And that's why we're putting Making Assumptions in this week's Spotlight. You want to live like common people. You want to see whatever common people see. It was the anthem for a class-conscious Britain. But 20 years after Pulp hit the charts, does society still make assumptions about who you are and where you come from. On Monday, David Cameron announced that universities and top employers will now do name-blind applications after research suggested ethnic-sounding names don't look good on the CV. If you don't deal with the issue of discrimination, you can never have true opportunity, which is what we all want to see. Few would have imagined the boy brought up above a Cumbrian pub would become the nation's cultural expert. But as Melvin Bragg's novel about the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 Remind us that people have fought social assumptions for centuries. Who would have thought that during the Peers' Revolt of 2015, ermine-clad lords and ladies would be the ones standing up for the working poor? These proposals blatantly threaten damage to the lives of millions of our fellow citizens. So maybe it doesn't matter whether you live like common people or the not-so-common people, is making assumptions about others, whether based on race or class or gender, just dangerous. And we're delighted to be joined by Melvin Bragg. Welcome. Uh, working class kid gets to Oxbridge. People make assumptions about you? Well, what do they think and assume what they want? <laughs> That's their right, isn't but it? But did you ever feel that, that, that you were categorised? Yeah, but it doesn't matter very much. So you get on with what you want to do, and if you're lucky enough to be able to do what you want to do, that's enough. And it didn't hold you back? I didn't think, well, hold me back? I don't know. I've done what I wanted to do, and that's... What, what more could you want? Yeah. <laughs> there, there is a, a tendency in this country that we do categorise. Was it Noel Coward who said an Englishman has to open his mouth and another Englishman has classified him? Mm -hmm. yeah, there's still something in that. Bernard Shaw said the same, and it's still largely true. We say people from whichever city it is in the north of England uh, have the least chance of being believed in court, getting jobs. It still goes on. It isn't quite, it isn't as hard and fast as it was, but it's still there. Is it part of the, uh, this country's still class system, obsession with class, that, uh, uh, that we do make assumptions about people in a way that other countries may not as much? I think other countries do, but on not not quite as clearly and as hard cut, not with eight or nine hundred years of tradition behind them. We've got very good at it over these last <laughs> few centuries. We've had practice. That's right. It's, it's changed quite a bit, really, but it's still there, it's still solid. It's a class system, but there are other things which un uh, uh, corrode it and embellish it uh, simultaneously, so it's changing. It's interesting that uh, in the 21st century, though, the Prime Minister is saying that for big companies, for universities, uh, don't put your name on the application form. And when they don't put their name on the application form, an awful lot of people from state schools get the job in the universities. Mm. And when you look at the university results, people from state schools tend to do rather better than people from... If they can get into the universities. Into, in the, yeah. You see that at Oxford place. as well as everywhere else. Is that a useful thing to do? To, because what the Prime Minister was saying was that there seemed to be evidence that if it was an ethnic name, then you might not even get through the first hurdle. There might be that, 
I, I, it's quite difficult to talk about that, this without a lot more evidence than I've got, Andrew. I know what I read in newspapers, what I hear from Leeds or I'm Chancellor or from Oxford, which I keep in touch with, but this is still basically anecdotal. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact is that since I went to university, 5% went, now 45% mm -hmm. go. I go, I go to, to Leeds, a university regularly. And I You're see the Chancellor there? Yeah, and I've been there for about 14 years. And you see people from all arts and parts in there. Similarly at Wadham College, Oxford, which is the most diverse college in Oxford. It's changed an awful lot um, and that's something to hold on to. Change for the better too. I think so. And so do the people in charge, so do the tutors, so do the chancellors, so do the heads of colleges. Are we so prone to make assumptions? Uh, yes, I mean for example we, used, we debated a lot in the last parliament uh, where all the leaders were Oxbridge mm -hmm. uh, uh, by background. The fact that this created an enormous barrier between them and the electorate and I think it did. I think the electorate really thought that anyone who had been to Oxford or Cambridge was more or less a figure from Mars. And that was interesting because I think at one time the Labour Party was very hopeful that they were going to paint David Cameron and George Osborne as toffs who were remote. Mm. But no, as far as the electorate was concerned, Ed Balls and Ed Miliband were just as remote mm. because they'd been to Oxford. So I think uh, I'm not sure that we are more class conscious than other countries. I'm not sure we've had more centuries of doing it. But I do think we're more anti-intellectual than most other countries. Do you think we're still prone to make assumptions? Yeah, I think it's more complex than just class. It is, about, it is about gender and it's about all these things. And there is evidence, certainly on race, uh, uh, not so much, I don't know about evidence in university applications, but if you look at uh, people applying for jobs, if you have got a, a name which puts you down as a... a, a, a somebody from, from an a, ethnic a, background. An ethnic background, you are... I can't remember, much, much less likely to get an interview, to get through that first hurdle. Mm. So I think it is... Conf I actually welcome what the Prime Minister is doing on this. I think this mm. is, you know, a move in the right direction. I don't think it's enough. I mean, when you go to, you know, I, m my children's friends who tried for Oxford, who all went through comprehensive schools, it's not just getting there to the interview stage. People recruit in their own kind. So the sort of questions that the tutors will ask you uh, when you go for that interview, are very much based on the sort of stuff you'd learn if you went to a private school rather than a comprehensive school. So the barriers are pretty complex and it needs, I think, a, a complex set of interventions. This country, of course, unlike, say, France or America, founded in revolution, has quite a lot of continuity in its, its history. You've done this book on the, the Peasants' Revolt going back to 1381. It failed in, in the end. If it had succeeded in some way, would, would, would we be a much different society if we'd had more revolutionary upheaval? When is the end? Well, I, <laughs> it depends what you mean by failed. It's the biggest insurrection that there's ever been in this country per capita. Uh -huh. It came at a time of the Black Death, as you know. Population was being halved, mm. halved in the 14th century. Which pushed up wages. Yeah, it was led by, and, and depressed some other wages. Mm. We were working in It was led by artisans and aldermen, and people were not just running around with pitchforks, although pitchforks are partly a nasty weapon. And they had, it, was a, it was a debate across what we would now call, it's quite different, the middle and lower middle classes, the low gentry. Mm. So it's, much, it's a big rebellion. And it's massively successful until the leader is assassinated. It's in, in, in a few days, it takes the, one of the toughest castles in this country, which in an in, in afternoon, which took King John nine months to breach. Oh. It gets <laughs> into London, which no other army did. It gets into the White Tower, which was inconceivable. It yes. forces the king to meet them three times. It is in that sense very successful. It fails, but it sets the tone for what has become since then one stream of English history which is radical okay. and the idea that people rebelling triggered often by taxes this was triggered by the poll tax in 1381 mm. right. and people gathering around it to rebel and move to rebellion whether it's marches uh, whatever mm. it is right. it's a great <laughs> book I enjoyed it we've talked about it <laughs> Melvin thank you for being with us that's your love tonight